Evening, everybody. So, just to give some sort of context on schedule, first we'll go through sort of the how, the why, context surrounding what ACA.net is, why we need it, that kind of thing. Um, so, that'll take about an hour. And then we'll have a sort of open Q&A session where people are free to ask whatever they like on topics related to ACA.net, whether that's internal stuff, whether it's things like getting started, guides, that kind of thing, whether you want to know architecture type questions, so how you can fit it into your existing architecture, whether it's optimised for your use case, these kind of things, and just general distributed systems questions. But first, let's get started. So, some of you might know me, I'm Anthony, I'm a software engineer down in London working at a company called AdBrain. If you ever need to get hold of me, you can contact me through one of those two means. But first, let's, let's talk about computers, because they've changed quite a lot. Computers are still a relatively young thing, you know. Realistically, trans first transistor was mid middle of the 20th century, it's still relatively young. And they've changed a lot. So we can go from the early origins of the personal computer in the home. So this is what comes up in a Google search for computers in the 1980s. I wasn't alive in the 1980s, so I'm only going by this. It's clearly quite a sporty activity in the 80s. Um, this is quite obviously how people dressed. And I don't doubt that at all. So that's, that's my... Yeah. <laughs> It was just like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is what I'm going on. Um, and then they kept changing more and more. And somebody decided, let's connect them all together when they start getting popular. And then this guy said, actually, let's like, share documents and files between everybody. And we'll create something called the internet and the world wide web. And we'll be able to get computers more popular and everything. And the newspapers at the time reported with headlines like this. Um, yeah, that's headline from The Sun uh, in 1995, I think, which... Source of Truth? Yes, yeah, Source of Truth. Um, but yeah, internet won't change anybody's life. We'll just spend the time looking at cat pictures, it's fine. Um, and it's kept growing and growing and growing from there. The internet has caught on, I guess. It's become quite popular. Um, and we're now at a stage where we can see headlines like... Uh, this on news websites. Why is my fridge having a Gmail login anywhere? Um, I don't know, but apparently this is the sort of world we live in now where we've got tens of millions of devices that are capable of connecting to the internet. I think ARM predicted something like 1 billion CPUs cores will be able to connect to the internet by 2020, I think. Don't quote me on that. But we've seen a lot of changes as well. So processors have like got massively faster. We've gone from having like 20 megahertz processors to like three gigahertz processors. That's order of magnitudes difference in such a short period of time. We've got more <laughs> processor cores to work with as well. We've gone from being just a single core where we step through every line of code one after the other to being in a situation where we can have Four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two cores, I think, maybe even sixty-four in a single processor. That's a lot to work with. We've also got more RAM. Some of you might have seen that AWS have recently announced machines that have got two terabytes of RAM per instance, I think, which is a lot of RAM. Um, and we've also got faster networks, which have got more bandwidth connecting computers together. So we've now got these possibilities of joining machines together better. But Despite all this, we've still got one key aim at the end of it. We want to make sure that the applications that we write are pleasant experiences for our end users. It doesn't matter whether your end user is Jeff in finance or millions of people around the world who are wanting to share their thoughts in less than 140 characters. You want to make sure that their experience is pleasant. Yet, we just kind of assumed for a while that Computers would keep getting faster and we could write worse and worse code and it'd be fine because computers will get faster. Um, and this is what's happened. We've seen massive growth in the number of transistors. But round about here, 2003, 2005, computers started slowing down in processing speeds. The Pentium 4 was kind of the peak of performance with 3 gigahertz processors. Since then, we've not really evolved past there. 
Um, so we're just getting to a stage where we can't physically make code run faster because we've got limitations on things like the heat that these processes generate and just the actual physical bandwidth of the underlying silicon. Which means that we can't just keep saying, get a better server, get a better server, get a better server, it'll all work out. You reach a limit at a time. And once you're spending $500,000 on a server, you've got to start asking the question, could we have written this a little bit better? So, what's the options then? If we can't scale up, what can we do instead? Well, we said that CPUs have got more cores and networks are now faster, really fast in fact. One gigabits per second broadband speeds are now possible. Um, so yeah, we've now got the option of scaling out across multiple cores, across multiple servers in effect. But to be able to do scale out, we've got to do lots of work simultaneously. We can't just say, we'll just add more servers and it'll all work out. It rarely works out like that. So in order to actually do this work simultaneously, we need one of two things. We need either parallelism or we need concurrency. Now, parallelism is really easy for embarrassingly parallel tasks. So you might have encountered some of these situations yourself where you're just kicking off a bunch of jobs all at the same time and they don't rely on one another. So this includes things like Monte Carlo simulations, where you're just saying, let's predict every possible output, uh, financial modeling, which works on a similar sort of basis, all these kind of things where you're just saying, we'll provide a different input for everything, kick it off, and we'll just see what the results are at the end. But not everything we write is that easy, unfortunately. And to be able to make these more complex tasks, we need to use concurrency. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Is there actually a difference between parallelism and concurrency? Well, it turns out that there is. So, this along the bottom is parallelism. Basically, we say, here's job one, here's job two. Job one gets a thread, job two gets a thread. Both of you, off you go, and we'll see you when you're finished. It works, but it means that it takes up a whole thread for a single job, regardless of what you're doing. Concurrency, however, says, well, I can do this part of this job on this thread, and I can do this part of that job on a separate thread, and I can keep switching them around and schedule them in the most effective ways. So we can get to a stage where we've got applications which are starting to run more effectively because they're using up all the possible threads that they've got available to them, even if they're a bit more complex. But turns out concurrency is really hard. Who would have thought trying to coordinate lots of things at the same time would be difficult? And the great thing about concurrency is there's lots of jokes that you can make with pictures of dogs. So, multi-threading in theory, everything works perfectly. Everything gets its own thread. Multi-threading in practice, it ends up in a horrific mess everywhere. You can also do things like this. Look at my multi-threading code. It's a mess. It's the intention was there, it was definitely there. Execution, not quite though. And you've also got things like this. You can end up creating thread pools with 10 threads and then only one of them is doing the work. So how many threads does it actually take to change a light bulb? Essentially, the key thing that we're getting out of this is we don't want to write multi-threaded code if we can avoid it. We want to be able to say, just make it multi-threaded. I don't care how you do it at the end of the day, just make it multi-threaded. And for that, we need to use concurrency abstractions instead. So, concurrency ab abstraction sounds like a complicated thing, but you've probably already used one yourself in the form of .NET tasks. You might have used them in Scala as futures, you might have used them in JavaScript as promises, in Haskell as uh, monads, whatever it uses under the hood, um, F sharp, async workflows, all work on the same sort of principle of complete this task, then once you've done that, go on and complete another. But it turns out that there is another alternative that we can use, which comes in the form of actors. Now, actors aren't a new concept. First paper relating to them came out in 1972. 
Um, Smalltalk was kind of an implementation of actors, and you, know, you can see some of the principles surrounding actors within the Smalltalk language. Uh, but it's really recently kicked off with the likes of Akka, i uh, see more and more growth in the JVM world. But Akka was never really the starter for it. Erlang was a big winner there. Uh, so Erlang was a project from Ericsson, uh, the telecoms company, once owned by Sony as well, in the form of Sony Ericsson. Um, but Erlang was the language that they used to make all of their telecom switches and everything. And they built everything using actors. And the router or switch, whatever it was that they built with it, ended up getting 99.99999999% availability during its several year long lifespan. And that was all thanks to the possibilities that were opened up through the use of actors. So now I know what you're thinking. Why are tasks bad? Well, tasks aren't bad. They just solve a different sort of problem. Tasks are brilliant for the sort of jobs where you're doing execute task A, then once you've finished, execute task B, then do task C, etc. And it makes it really easy to chain them together. Actors, on the other hand, say, actually, I don't care what you're doing, and what I'm going to do instead is promote isolation over coordination. Because this is kind of what it's like when you're writing multi-threaded code. You've got lots of people working on it at the same time, and one of them slips and it all falls down. Actors say, actually, I'm going to keep something internal to me, and none of you can act on it. So actors are essentially independent entities. They're all well-formed, well-rounded, you can't talk to them inside. Now, why does any of this matter? Well, we said that we need applications to be responsive. We want users to have the best possible experience that they can possibly get whenever they're using our applications. But what does it mean for an application to actually be responsive? We can say the word responsive all we like, but it's got a lot of uses. You know, we see things like responsive web design. Ultimately, what is responsive in this definition? Well, we say it's for an application to be responsive, it needs to work no matter what the scenario currently is. What do I mean by that? Well, what does your application do if tons of people are going and hitting it at the same time? Does your application start to slow down for them? If it is, can it really be considered responsive? If you're writing an e-commerce website, and you've got thousands of people coming at your website literally throwing money at you, do you really want to be turning them away because your website took 10 seconds to load instead of the half a second it usually takes? The answer, probably not. What do you do in the event of service failure? No doubt some of you will be relying on things like external APIs, uh, external databases, external internal services, these kind of things. What do you do if one of those goes down? And it's an interesting question, because for a lot of people, it's something that they don't really consider. We just assume that everything will be fine all of the time, and it'll all work out eventually. Now, this is quite a jump, but bear with me. If we want to be able to do any of these things, we essentially need loose coupling under the hood. If I want to be able to scale out, I can't just say, I want this one instance, this is the only thing I know about. We need to be able to say, take it whoever can. I don't care who's going to deal with it, just make sure you deal with it. I don't give any consideration to the underlying... <laughs> um, yeah, I don't give any consideration to the underlying technology of where it goes. Just something that can handle it should. If something fails, either redirect it to somewhere better or do something else with it, whatever that may be. All of these come with loose coupling. Now, the thing that we need, though, is a common language for these kind of applications that we're writing. We need a lingua franca. If we're in a situation where we've got companies saying, I'm doing this with all of these terms, and I'm doing this with all of these terms, we end up with a lot of mismatch. And we just don't get the sort of knowledge sharing and communication that we'd like, that we all like in the software development world. And it turns out that a group of developers, a group of major companies, who were working at 
significantly larger scales than we might have seen before, got together and sat down and discussed and chatted about the sort of things that they'd seen when they were writing these applications. And they came up with something called the Reactive Manifesto. And so these companies included the likes of, I think it was Twitter, uh, TypeSafe were in there who made ACA. Now, the Reactive Manifesto is essentially nothing more than what we've discussed so far. We've said that we want our applications to be responsive. That's our key aim at the end of the day. For them to be responsive, they need to be resilient. They need to handle failures in the best possible way. They need to be elastic as well. If we've got lots of people accessing them at the same time, we need our services to be able to work constantly, regardless of what's happening. And the underlying technology powering this is message passing architectures. So that's what gives us our loose coupling. Now, the official definition of a reactive application then is a reactive application reacts to its environment, which sounds really woolly, but it's actually quite a nice definition. Yeah, we want them to be able to react to the likes of service failure, to increase traffic, all of these kind of things. Um, but some people do think it's a bit woolly. So if you search for reactive manifesto on Google, that's one of the next suggestions. Um, each to their own, I guess. But uh, I was really interested in saying that not the reactive manifesto is bullshit. It's just about the fact that you don't have to write it down that your application should not crash yet. Yeah. yeah. But it, I just find it funny that that is the next suggestion for the actual topic. So, we've said that we want our applications to be responsive. We've also said that actors are a great tool for helping us spread our work more and distribute it more evenly. So, that means that we can use actors to write reactive applications, right? So, before we get into that, let's talk a bit more about the specifics of what an actor actually is. An actor is essentially three key components. It's a mailbox. It's something that we can communicate with. It's a behavior. That's something that works on the messages that we receive. And it's some state, so that's some internal thing. The great thing about actors is we can think of them a lot like people. So time for some audience participation. What's your name? Matt. Matt. Now, I didn't know Matt's name before. And I'm sure many, of, I'm sure you can attest to that, Matt. Yes. <laughs> now, <laughs> Matt has got some state associated with him in the form of knowledge, in the form of memories. Now, unfortunately, I can't just jump into somebody's head and take everything that they know out of their brain. It doesn't really make sense. Um, so what we've got to do is we've got to communicate with other people to try and retrieve that knowledge, those memories, out of their head to be able to share it with others. And you've got some behavior associated with you, right? If somebody talks to you, you're going to reply to them. I'm sure I like where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I asked you the question, what's your name? You naturally knew the answer of, it's Matt, because it's what you've got stored within you. And you've got a mailbox, which is effectively your ears, but it's also your other senses as well. If I hit my hand, I know that there's something there. That's another potential input into my behavior, which will affect what my internal state is. In that case, state might be the position of my hand, all of this kind of thing. So we can think of actors <coughs> as being these isolated, independent entities, much like people are, which is, for many, quite a nice thing, because we don't have to worry about sharing information and that kind of thing with other people. So, as we said, we saw that actors are strongly isolated. They completely encapsulate their state. You can't share it with somebody else. If I've got an actor, I can't just jump straight into it and say, I'll have all the information that you've got. It's completely hidden within the boundaries of the actor, completely segregated from the rest of the application. You don't know about it. So to modify this state, what we do is we, send, we have a behavior which is responsible for it. So in our case, with a human, the behavior is just what happens when one of our sensors detects an input, whether that's sight, sound, smell, you know, touch, all these kind of things. 
And the way that we invoke this behavior is by sending a message to it. So in the case before, the message was, I'm just going to speak out at you. Another message might have been me putting my hand out to somebody. Your brain will pick that up and your behavior will be to shake the other person's hand. All of these kind of things are the key principles of how actors work. Then, messages get processed serially. So if we had five people ask Matt your name all at the same time, you're not just gonna, you'll respond to them each in their own time. So you, if I was to ask you your name and uh, Mark was to ask you your name as well, you, know, you might respond to me and then to Mark because it's the order in which people have asked you. Now, when we talk about this, we see three common things which an actor is possible or which an actor is capable of doing once it receives a message. So once we receive a message, we can send a, no a finite number of messages to other people. So I might say to you, what's your name? And you might say, it's Mark. You might also then pass a message on to somebody else that says, what's your name? And we process down a chain. We can just send our messages out to anybody who asks or who, anybody who we want to speak to. We can also spawn a finite number of actors. Um, so when you're in a business, you know, you've got employees who are underneath you, you know, who are working uh, on <coughs> things that you're responsible for. So you just pass the work down effectively. And then, because we can't, one of us isn't capable of doing a lot of work by ourselves, we pass it down and we split it across all of the children who are associated with them. In this case, the children being the employees. And the other thing that an actor can do is change how it responds to the next message. So, if I told you the weather tomorrow was going to be raining and you previously thought it was sunny, if somebody else asks you the weather next time, you might be able to say now, well, it's going to rain tomorrow. So we can change how we respond to our next message, whether that's by effectively changing our state or changing our associated behavior with that state. So that brings us on to the next question of, well, how can we write actors? We've seen what an actor is. We've seen what our end goal when writing applications is. How can we write actors? Well, it turns out there's a great library available for it in the form of Acker.net. Now, Acker.net is a .NET port of the Acker project, originally written in Scala for the JVM. So Acker has seen a lot of usage. Um, companies like Gilt use it, companies like or it's, I think it forms the basis of Spark. It sees significant worldwide usage, and there isn't a scholar conference goes by that you won't see an Acker talk at it. Now, let's talk about how we can actually use it then. So, our first thing to do is we've got to define an actor, as we've seen. You know, an actor is a number of key components provided, and Acker.net provides those for us. So. An actor in Acker.net is nothing more than a typical c -sharp class. All we've got to do is inherit from a specific class, and we can just set up handlers which respond to certain messages. So in this case, we just say, whenever I receive a string message that's been sent to me, all you're going to do is write it out onto the console. So in this case, our message is just a string. Our message can be any .NET type that we want. The only thing that you need to consider is your messages need to be immutable. If you use mutable messages, it can break down the guarantees that you get provided through actors in a multi-threading sense. The next thing that we need to do is we need to create somewhere we, where we can actually host the actor. You know, it's got, we've got to have something responsible for actually doing all the underlying message passing and deployment and all that kind of thing. And for that, we've got the concept of an actor system. As I say, an actor system is kind of like the building which hosts all of the people. You know, they can then communicate within that building or they can communicate externally through letters, phone, etc. That's essentially what an actor system is. Just somewhere where we can host all of our actors. So in this case, I've just created one and I've called it greeter system. Really simple, that's all there is to it. 
The next thing that we need to do is we need to actually have our actor which exists within that actor system. To do that, we have to spawn it. To spawn it, really simple. All we do is we say system dot actor of and then the type of the actor. Now, key point to realize is that when we call this, we don't get back an instance of this. That's the key thing. What we get back is a reference to our actor. A reference, not in the sense of a .NET reference, a C Sharp reference, a reference in the sense of an ACA.NET reference. This is something that you can then send a message to, and it will then be processed internally by ACA.NET. So when you spawn it, you don't have any concept of knowledge of where the actor has actually been spawned. Instead, it gets deployed wherever ACA.NET thinks it's appropriate, whether that's on a local machine, whether that's on a remote machine. You don't care about that. You don't even care about which thread the actor is running on. You don't care when it's running. You just care that your messages do get processed eventually at some point in time. So we also have the concept of hierarchy with an ACA.NET. So when we spawn the actor, we have this. This is our root god actor, essentially. This is in charge of all of your actors which get spawned below it. So when we spawned our greeter actor, for example, it might have been spawned to here. In this case, we've got a parent who's responsible for it. And we'll see why that's important later on. It forms a key basis of one of the best parts of actor.net. So once we've then got our actor, the next thing that we can do is we can talk to it. We can communicate with it like we saw before. To do that, all it is is a case of saying greeter.tell and we pass in a message. So in the case that we sent it, the message to the actor that we created before, all it would do is print out to the console, hello DDDEA, because I forgot to change this slide. <laughs> <laughs> Internally, yeah, close enough. It's East Anglia, right? <laughs> Essentially, under the hood, what ACA.NET does is it picks up that you wanted to pass a message. It says, I'll queue this up into that actor's mailbox. And at some point in the future, that actor will pick up the message. It'll invoke its behavior. So in our case, it'll flick through and it'll look through the associated behavior that we've got with it, which was our receive string and it'll invoke that behavior. And once it's invoked it, it'll just print it out to the console there. I know what some of you are asking. What about our shop? It's a good question. It's a very valid question. Um, there's a full f -sharp API available, and it's a really nice API. It's built upon all of the concepts that powered the Erlang API, essentially. So, built upon the Erlang foundations. This, I've still not fixed this slide. Um, this is an actor definition in F sharp. Bonus points to whoever sees the issue with it. Don't shout out. Some of you will have seen it. Um, all we're doing here is we're creating a recursive function, which is just, in our case, tail recursive. And what we've got here is we've got an actor, which is, in our case, just a computation expression. So what we do here is we just say, let the message, let the next message I receive come from the mailbox. And what it'll do is it'll block just here until it does receive a message. Once it receives a message, it'll then continue on. All of this happens asynchronously under the hood. You don't need um, where it says, we'll give you 99.9% .9 availability subject to like massive percentile change and everything like this. And so the cloud itself brings about failure, and lots of failures in certain cases. Um, but at the end of the day, your users don't want to see this. No matter how much you say, it's not our fault, it's not our fault, the last thing your user wants to see is that. Because there will be one of your users who has Twitter and follows Troy Hunt, and he will screenshot that, and he will send it to Troy Hunt, and he will make all of his followers laugh at you for doing something like this. Don't do something like this. It's a terrible user experience and it can be potential security threats as well. So don't do it. Essentially, what we need to do is we need to do what we do naturally. Whenever we see a failure, the first thing we think is, have you tried turning it off and on again? That's the first thing that anybody does. 
And the great thing is, it usually works. I've got more potential states of bits on my hard drive or on my SSD than there are atoms in the universe. Just by switching it off and on again, they all get reset to a known good state. So we need to isolate our errors within our applications and then try and automatically recover from them as best as we can. So, how do we actually isolate errors? So far, the example that we've seen, it picked up an error and what happened was that error then got passed all the way down to the user and the website decided the user's the best person to know that the database isn't available because your user can really affect that change and make it happen that the database will now continue to work. Now, the way we do it is we separate out our error channels. Now, what do I mean by that? When we're dealing with services, when we call a service, we've got one of two types of errors that we can get out of it. We can either have something as simple as you entered the wrong email, or we can have something as complex as I can't talk to a database. Um, and so what we do is, in our case, service B is the one that we're implementing at the moment. Uh, service A is something that we're communicating with. And service A has a supervisor attached to it. Some of you Linux users, anybody Linux users? Yeah? No? 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 Yes. Some of you might be familiar with the concept of a supervisor. I think they're called System D nowadays, so don't look into that. It's a massive argument. <laughs> um, but essentially what we do is we say, if service A gets a request and it massively fails somewhere, service B doesn't care about whether it failed internally. All service B cares about is getting an actual response back. And so what service A will do in the case of a failure is it'll say to its supervisor, it's all gone wrong. It's all broken. Please tell me what I should do. So a supervisor might do something as simple as saying, I'm going to switch you off and I'm going to restart you. And we'll see if that fixes the error. And it might try this a few times. And if that doesn't work, then it might choose to escalate the problem to its supervisor. So this is the concept of the hierarchy that we saw earlier. An actor has a parent who is then able to make decisions for that child. And we can make really deep nested hierarchies. And we can just pass all of the dangerous work off to children, which is the best idea ever. But sometimes, service B will provide something that just doesn't make sense. Whether that's a bad, uh, it might be something like a bad email. It might be a bad format for some verification that you've got to do. Something like that. Basically something where the user has done something wrong. In that case, service A will respond to it, not with an exception saying, it's all gone wrong, please fix it, but with a message that says, you've made a mistake here, you need to fix this up, and then I'll respond to your request appropriately. If the user does get it right, that one in a million time, they'll get the appropriate response back. So we just essentially separate off the things that are actually important to the user and tell them what they're interested in, whilst also removing all the stuff that they have no care for and letting us take care of that ourselves. So that's a key point of how the resilience works within Acker.net. Let's talk about handling increased load in a distributed system. So I'm guessing some of you, you know, you've either used Azure, you've used AWS, um, you've seen any of the Azure talks, all this kind of thing, where they go, look, all we'll do is we'll set this up to auto scale, and if we see more than 60% CPU usage, we'll just add more machines. That is effectively what we do. But sometimes we think the easiest way is just going to be to make our servers bigger, which it is. There's no doubt in that. To be able to say, I'll have a bigger server is a lot easier than saying, I'll have 10 servers. The applications that we need to write have to change architecturally. We saw earlier, though, that scale-up's got a limit. We reach a point where we can't physically buy a bigger server. And in those situations, we need to scale out. The great thing is, though, if we have something that nobody else can interact with, we can just put it wherever we like it. 
we've not got to worry about things like creating locks around an object so that some two things can access it at once. All we've got to say is just deploy that wherever. Just deploy that over there, over there, whether that's on a new computer, whether that's in a new data center in Australia, whatever, it doesn't matter. You just say, let's not care about the communicate, or let's not care about having things all working on the same item. So because actors give us isolation, scalability is really easy with actors. And we can effectively do like we do with our machines. So we can just say, let's create more actors. If I've got five actors at the minute, all of which are working heavily to respond to messages, let's just add 10, let's add 20, until they start to process requests a lot faster. And routing is such a key component of Acker.net that it includes a number of core routers straight out of the box, which will be appropriate for most use cases. So we've got the classic round robin approach at the top where we just say, I'm gonna send a message to actor one, then actor two, then actor three, then actor one. And just go around, cycle it through. Assuming all the messages take the same amount of time to process, it all works out perfectly. We also have things like the concept of broadcasting. So we can just say, here's 10 actors. You can all just do the work, it doesn't matter. So this works great for the parallelism tasks that we saw earlier. Things like our Monte Carlo simulations, financial simulations, all these kind of things. Because we can just really easily distribute a message to every actor that exists underneath that router. There's also another actor, which is consistent hashing router. So essentially with this, what we do is when we insert a message into our router, what it'll do is it'll create a hash of it. So whether that's something like murmur three, it will then pick it out and it'll say, I've got this ID. So I'm gonna send it to rooty two in this case. So it might have generated, A might hash to the value two. So it then passes it to rooty two. And the great thing about this is you can scale all these out at will. Even the consistent hashing router. Under the hood, it's got vnode support which is a brilliant feature that allows you to scale in and scale out these kind of things. So a lot of the stuff that I've covered so far has been sort of single machine um, ACK.net usage. I've touched on the more complex stuff, but not really gone into how you can really take ACK.net up to the next level. So the first thing you can do is since ACK has grown and grown and grown, it's become more of an ecosystem for great libraries and a brilliant foundation for building distributed systems. And one key part of this is Acker Remote. So what Acker Remote allows you to do is you can connect two actor systems together in a client and a server type architecture. So you can have actor system A and actor system B and they can send messages to one another over a wire, whether that's ethernet, whatever. Um, and we can also do things like say, actor system A can deploy an actor into actor system B remotely. <laughs> so it can just say, I want this actor, this greeter actor here, that wants to be deployed all the way over there. Excuse me, why it's a client server architecture? Why can't it be a cluster architecture? Good question. Which brings me on to the next slide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that was all set up, don't worry. <laughs> Building upon the ideas of Acker Remote, we can start to use things like Acker Cluster, where we say, here's 10 different servers. I want you to treat them all as a single actor system. So we can then start to do things like, um, yeah, we can treat them all as one single actor system, which means we can do things like cluster aware routing. So the routers that we saw previously, where we can do things like round robin. We can do round robin routing, it's a mouthful, um, to every node that exists within our cluster. We can do things like broadcasting to every node that exists within a cluster. We can do consistent hashing to everything that's within a router, kind, or within a cluster, kind of like how React works. <laughs> we can also do things like cluster sharding. So once we've got a deep hierarchy of actors, we can split that hierarchy up and deploy them 
onto multiple nodes within a cluster and split them apart. The thing about actors so far is they all exist within memory. There's nothing touches disk. Everything that happens happens ephemerally. Ephemerally? I think that's Yeah. Everything that happens is ephemeral. That's a bad way of saying it. Nothing is persistent until you use something like Akadot Persistence. Now, the great thing about Akadot Persistence is it allows you to do really easy event sourcing and CQRS-based apps. Because all you do is you say, an actor is going to be my aggregate root. Every message that I pass to it is a command. From that, emit the event, save the event, and then operate with any side effects that I want to do. Makes it really, really easy to create CQRS and event sourcing based apps. The next one, this is the one that I work on occasionally, uh, it's ACA distributed data. So we saw that uh, actors don't share any data at all between them. ACA distributed data allows you to, do, to actually share data between them in an eventually consistent and safe way, which means that you can store or you can keep your data local to multiple nodes within the active systems and operate as quickly as possible in cases like that. So yeah, it allows for sharing data between actors with strong eventual consistency. Under the hood, it uses things like CRDTs, um, which are a brilliant thing. If anybody wants to know more, do ask me. But um, it essentially allows you to have two actors operating on the same data at the same time they then merge them together, and it all works out fine. So the question that a lot of people want to know the answer to is, where can I actually use Akka.net? Yeah, well, I've seen Akka.net, and I'm starting to get the hang of it, I'm starting to like it, but where does it really shine? Well, one project that I used it on in the last year was an IoT-based application. So it was to do with farming and how we can better serve farmers to help them save water, use less water. Farming accounts for like 70% of the world's uh, fresh water usage, which is a massive amount. If we can bring that down, we can you know, help cut down on people who don't have access to clean drinking water. And for that, we used Acta.net. So we had hierarchies of fields, which had nodes, and every node had a sensor attached to it. So we were able to model each of these as a single actor. So a field actor had as its children some nodes, and as each node has children, they were the sensors associated with it. So we then, from our uh, sensors within the field, posted our data up to our web services, and we were able to do more aggregation and get more insight out of the data that we were seeing from these sensors in the field and we're able to do things like machine learning tasks on them. Another great one is job scheduling and cluster management. So with tools like Acker Cluster, it takes away a lot of the uh, pain, I'd say, of actually getting general overview and consensus of what's happening within a cluster because it's all provided out of the box for you, which means that it's really easy to do things like schedule work across all these nodes in a cluster. You know, if you want to, so what I was working on was load testing databases. You know, you just create a cluster of machines. Each of the machines, you just deploy work onto. These then pick up on the work and just start hitting the databases. It meant that it was able to cut down the amount of work that I had to do by, you know, order of magnitude, essentially. Uh, another use case for it is in gaming both in gambling and more Farmville-type gaming, as in you know, casual, not as expensive, I'd say, but I don't think that's quite true with mobile games these days. Um, but essentially, it's this point of being able to build massive-scale gaming backends as simply as possible. So I think people have been um, recreating, like, uh, choose your own adventure type games and you know, massive scale uh, text adventure type games using Anchor.net just by talking to clusters of machines. 
and you can model it really easily with actors in that case. Another thing is user interfaces. <coughs> You're not tied to just using ACA.NET on the server. You can bring ACA.NET down onto the client and you can use those concurrency benefits on the client to help you write more responsive applications, whether that's in WPF, whether that's in Xamarin, whether it's in WinForms even. Under the hood, ACA.NET provides a number of different schedulers for the actors to execute, which essentially allows the work to be scheduled on things like UI threads. So actors are then able to modify UI, which is really handy and makes for a really pleasant experience when developing multi-threaded client-side applications. Another one, microservices deployments. So I've mentioned things like the idea of job scheduling and cluster management. What we can do is we can say that each actor is actually a microservice and let ACA.NET under the hood take care of everything sort of relating to how our microservices communicate, where microservices get deployed within a cluster of machines, which makes it really easy to take care of all that. You just say, I'm going to deploy a new microservice, and ACA.NET deals with everything there for you. To communicate with it, you just send it a message and a way to response. Really, really easy. So essentially, ACA.NET provides a solid foundation for the strong constraints being imposed on us today and in the future, as we've got more and more users who are wanting faster and faster applications given the constraints that we've got with the servers that we've provided. ACA.NET provides a great foundation for us to build upon and work towards it, work towards faster, faster applications. So some of you will probably want to learn more after that. You know, you've seen this, sort of getting, getting that twitch. Do you want to play with ACA.NET? Do you want to try it? The best place to start is the ACA.NET bootcamp by a long way. So this was a GitHub project and sort of email schooling type thing where you do a lesson a day. And it started by two of the guys who work on ACA.NET. So it's Aaron Stannard and Andrew Scottsco. They started a up a company called Petabridge who do ACA.NET consultancy and general distributed systems consultancy. And as part of that, they put together the ACA.NET Bootcamp, which is a great resource and it takes you through doing simple stuff as in really simple stuff, like in your first lesson or in your first unit, you create a ACA.NET version of the tail command in Linux. And it takes you all the way through to being able to write a clustered application which does web scraping from GitHub. So it gradually takes you through and by the end of it, you can see real world applications and how you'd architect them. There's also a book coming out soon and I've said this quite a few times now, that it is coming soon, but it is actually coming soon now. I've chosen the front cover and everything, so it's got to be coming soon. Um, so that will be on Meep soon, hopefully, and that will take you through more of the internals of ACA.NET and the specific components of it. So things like, we'll briefly touch on what a reactive application is, as we've seen tonight, and key principles of how we design them and the things that ACA.NET provides us to be able to write these applications. So it goes into detail, things like the routing, the uh, failure handling, all the way up to clustering, remoting, persistence, all those kind of things. There's also a lot of questions on Stack Overflow at the minute. And the ACA.NET contributors do try and respond to the questions as best we can. Um, if you do have any questions, do feel free to ask them on there. People will do their best to fix them. And if not, then what happens is there's a message gets put in the ACA.NET chat room and somebody else will try and come out and, and solve it for you. Some of you might have got that open source... Oh. It's only a little bit, right? It's not on the site, anyway. Oh yeah, there's some come up on Pluralsight recently as well. So if you've got Pluralsight accounts, uh, there's quite a few ACA.NET courses coming up on there. Uh, they're definitely worth a watch as well. I've heard good things about them, but I've not yet had a chance to actually look at them myself. Some of you might be prolific open source contributors who want to help out in the best way that they can. Um, and ACA.NET is no different. It's completely open source. And there's plenty of up for grabs issues as well. So if you do want to help out, if you do want to pick up something, you want to learn a bit more about distributed systems, all that kind of thing, do feel free to just pick up an up for grabs issue. Anybody 
there will try and help you in the best way possible because we've also got a Gitter chat room where we'll generally sort of hang out and try and address people's issues in the best possible way. <coughs> so, pizza is currently here. So, I think, shall we break for pizza? And then after that, we'll do like an informal Q&A session where you can ask anything you want, as I say, on Acker.net, whether it's on things like clustering, whether it's on architecture design, whether it's on general distributed system stuff. Doesn't matter, ask away, and I'll try my best to answer it. But for now, pizza. Thank you very much. Andrew.